If you want to get better at sales, this episode is for you. My next guest has built and sold multiple businesses, and in this episode, he breaks down nine sales tips that can help you convert more leads into sales. Please welcome Dan Jordan. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm like pumped to be here today. I sure hope so. We got a lot to cover on the topic of sales. Before we get into it, can you tell us something about yourself that most people don't know? Gosh. Well, you you had just asked me how to pronounce my name. And probably what most people don't know is that's not my real name. I, when my, uh, my dad came to America from France in uh, like 1950 or something like that, you know, he's a guy, Henry, so Henri. And her last name would, would have been Zegel, which is like Siegel. And you, you can't be a, hair, a French hairdresser <laughs> being like Henri Siegel. And so he was driving down, not driving, he was walking on 73rd Street in Manhattan years ago. And there was a clothier there, uh, Louis Jordan, and he changed his name on the spot. So that's my name, Dan Jordan, just from that's, that. That's a fun story. <laughs> Makes it a little easier, right? If you make it a little easier to pronounce. I know people in Hollywood have done this. Their name can be complex and they'll change it to something uh, very simple. And there's a marketability there. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And a lot of people compare me to uh, Hollywood stars. So I get it. I can see that. (laughs) Well, (laughs) let's go ahead and dive in. If you could take a few minutes here and tell us about your career background. Oh, gosh. Uh, it'll be really fast. It'll be very quick. I was uh, born in uh, Brooklyn, uh, New York. I uh, grew up in uh, a little town called Fairlawn, New Jersey, and I had a perfect life and a mama's boy type of thing. Just everything's good. My senior year of high school, my parents decided to get divorced. It was traumatic for me. And so I took it out on my mother and I said, enough with college. That's what everybody's expecting me to do bunch of garbage. I took my college money and bought myself a butcher shop, like in the next town over, turned it into a deli, DJ's Country Deli, uh, built that thing up after several years, sold it, um, started a restaurant supply business in Manhattan, built that up, sold it, uh, moved to Atlanta, uh, became a stockbroker. And uh, one day I realized that everybody was getting divorced. And I said, I don't want to be a stockbroker anymore. And uh, Bought one of my clients' business, and I had a pest control business, a lawn care business, a truck rental business, sold that, had a staffing company, built that up, sold that, consulting company, and uh, all, see, what happens is my whole life, I'm really good at building up and growing businesses. I'm a horrible manager. It's like doing the actual stuff bores the dickens out of me, and so- uh, Started a company helping people get more customers and learning how to sell and closing and and having a joyous time of my life. There's my career world. I, I love it. I love the career backstory. And I've, I've met a lot of people like you in that position. They're really good at that startup phase. But when they get to the process phase of like maintaining and and kind of doing the simple but boring things over and over does not excite them. Like You'll see those people that get to corporate America, they're very good at taking a company from like 10 million to 100 million, but they're horrible at the zero to 10 million mark or you back it up further, right. like zero to a million because they, mm-hmm. they're they not nimble, so, super creative, you know, but when you can, mm-hmm. you got a proven system and now we need to make it more efficient, It's it, which can be not as exciting. Um, they thrive in that area. So you're really focused on that startup the beginning, getting it to that, you could say million AR. Is there a number you focus on or doesn't that really matter? Like uh, revenue? No, I mean, they got to have enough to afford me. But it, what it is, is um, it's not just startup because many people are restarting up uh, all the time. Right. And, you know, environments change, the industries change, things change, people quit, you're starting again. And, you know, one of my things my wife always says to me, why do we always have to start from zero? And you know, I try to, I try to figure it out. But really, is because because that's who I am. If if I, I I just learned a long time ago, a lot of this stuff that I have comes from my dad. Um, and being Father's Day yesterday was a it was one of those things that I was thinking about. Weird thing, you know what? My dad's no longer alive, but on like Father's Day, like on days that holidays that I want to remember him, I find myself eating the food that he liked. 
Hmm. And like that gets me go like yesterday I had schmaltz herring. When was the last time you had schmaltz herring? You're thinking about Papa. So hey, a lot of things come from my dad. So my dad was a uh, immigrant from France. Obviously, he, we lost mm-hmm. uh, it, I'm only telling you this because it's contextual with, with the next yeah. thing I'm about to say. But my dad uh, lost his father in a uh, concentration camp in, you know, during World War II, like in Auschwitz type of thing. So he didn't really have much of an education. He finally got here. It's just a sixth grade education. So um, he didn't give me much advice, but the advice he gave me was just awesome when it came, you know? Mm-hmm. So it would, it would start like this. It would start like this, Danny in this country. And then he'd give me this. So when I heard yes. that, you know, your ears perk up. So he says, Danny in this country, you get a job, you have one customer and he's called the boss. And if he gets a wild hair up his tuchish, you got goonish. Goonish means nothing in Yiddish. Mm-hmm. You got nothing. But he says, but Danny, if you're a salesman or a business owner, well, then you have a hundred bosses, but they're called customers. And if one of them fires you, who cares? You got 99 more, you know, but he was trying to say that financial security and just, just security in itself doesn't come with the ability. Uh, it, it doesn't come with having a job. Uh, it comes with the ability of being able to earn an income anytime, anywhere, any place in any language. And so that's the passion and that kind of drive, you know, keeps you moving forward, always trying to meet the next person that could, that could change your life. The other thing he would say is if you're not growing, you're shrinking. Mm -hmm. If you're not climbing, you're sliding. You're never even Steven. You're never all set. And as soon as you think you are, that's when you need to sell. I mean, that's the end. Yeah. And so it's almost like a fear of not moving forward that keeps me active like yeah. that. Yeah. It might be a, I, you might be delving into deep psychological challenges here with my life, but thank you very uh, much. Michelle. Yeah. Glad to have you work through these problems on yeah. the show. <laughs> I'm here for you. I'm here for you. <laughs> right. And in the tech world, they'll say the phrase, if you're not growing, you're dying. Um, yeah. right. So you're, you're hundred percent on the mark. You, you've got a common track record here of building business, like repeated systems you've used to build and sell businesses. I know I brought you on because you caught my attention to the audience here. You may laugh at this, but I fell on Dan's email list. I have no idea. Cause I don't join a lot of email lists and I'm getting emails from this guy. I don't know if somebody passed it on to you and, and usually I just unsubscribe and I clicked on one of the emails and the sales tips you provided in just the first email itself. I was like, Oh, okay, this is really good stuff. So I just respond to that email and say, you got to come on my podcast. And here we are, I think like eight yeah. weeks later, or whatever, but that's it. Uh, it's it's funny how things work out like that, but like I didn't realize you also, you know, you built and sold multiple businesses. Can you kind of talk about what are the common levers you're pulling with each business that, you know, my audience are looking for proven tactical formulas and what they can use yeah. is essentially where I'm driving here. Yeah, well, I, 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 I'll answer the question at, with it being as, you know, not being woo woo, but it really yeah. does start with your mindset. Uh, and and it comes with this this basic just understanding and belief and beliefs. Are, maybe I'll get into beliefs in a moment here. But the first most important thing you must understand about business that the definition of a business is not having a process. The definition is not having a tools, not having an office, a computer. The definition of a business is having a customer. And so when you wake up in the morning, you think to yourself. How do I get a new customer today? And that drives you forward. Because with a customer, you can get all the other things. But with all the other things, you're still not in business. You got no revenue coming in. And so if it's not you, there's got to be somebody in your organization that wakes up in the morning and is just like, Oh, do you see what I saw? I saw that guy doing that. I think I got an idea for a customer today and just go after that. So it, yeah. it comes with that headstrong uh, mindset. I am going to get a, a a new a customer or a new revenue today or, or, or die trying. I mean, it's just going to happen. 
I, you know? I absolutely and, and, love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, and really, and, and that's where it starts. And then I remember reading a long time ago uh, in one of every one of us, I imagine I'm looking at my bookcase there. I imagine you have a bookcase too. That's mm-hmm. somewhat large reading. Yeah. I remember reading like the old Sam Walton book and uh, Sam Walton uh, got to a point where he said, man, I, I need to, I need a consultant. I, I don't know what I'm doing right now. I know I'm losing money. I don't know what's happening here. And he went to this consultant and he opened up like in essence, a shoe box. And the guy looked at it, he goes, this is your receipts. This, this is how much you're doing. You know, this is, this is how, you know, he's go like, he didn't, he didn't know what was happening. All Sam Walton knew how to do was put a popcorn maker in front of his place and bring people in. He knew mm-hmm. how to get customers. Love you know, it. and the guy across the street didn't have a popcorn machine. And when the guy put a popcorn machine there, he put a jump cast away. He figured out a way to get people to his store. Yeah. Woke yeah. up in the morning, said, what do I have to do to get a new customer? And when you say about the number one thing, just that impossible to fail. Thank you for saying that. And and you probably met a lot of entrepreneurs that don't have that mindset. I've met a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs, but they are not hyper-focused on the customer? How do I get new customers? Or how do I, how about this? How do I, how do I better serve my current customers? So they tell their friends and family about me. Like that is a constant question. I think more entrepreneurs need to be asking is how do I, how do I do that situation? So referrals are like on autopilot. Yes. Wonderful. I, I love, I love referrals. And and I have processes to get referrals, and everybody should. Uh, but to scale, you got to learn how to sell to strangers. Mm-hmm. You got to learn, how, and now you get that by serving. Listen, those who serve the most earn the most. That's just how it works. And so it's not you're, you're trying to get. You're trying to offer advice. If you have a, a a a program, you know our programs. You know we can guarantee X amount of people that are going to come face to face meetings for you. Great. A lot of people can do that. But then you got to close these things. I mean, you got to you, and you have to commit yourself to doing the uncomfortable things. The reason why people say, yes, I want to get more customers, but don't really actually take the actions to do it is because they don't want to. And re- you could write this one down. Uh, the people who are really successful don't mind looking like an idiot, you know, and you're not trying to save your reputation. Their brand needs to be they're willing to do anything for their their client, not they're always safe. You know, you know? I sent a uh, I had an idea for somebody's company that I just knew would blow it up, and I had contacted him several times, and uh, this over the course of a year, and you know, all, all sorts of kind of creative things. I actually gave him the proposal. Uh, you know, of, of this is what I would do step by step, all this stuff. And so finally I got done. I sent him a a gallon of ranch dressing. And I said, and, and then the headline was like, sell the ranch on this idea. It's impossible to fail. And then, and, and I go, the secret is in the dressing. <laughs> he had to go in there. And I had like, a I did all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, to get him you know, just to get noticed for types of things. And and, le- and many times it doesn't work. And you got to feel like an idiot doing all that stuff. But then you get, no, but then you get calls. You know, I talk to somebody somehow. I, I get in touch with somebody in, in some way. And the first thing they do is look me up. And that's what happens to you out there. And that's what happens to anybody who's listening when you're in business. You're going to talk to somebody and, and they're thinking, oh, maybe I'll do some business, whatever. Let me look the person up. I mean, it's one thing. If they look you up and find out you're an axe murderer, not good. I got it. But even worse, what if they find nothing? Like, what if you looked up somebody who was making all these claims about what they could do for your business and you looked them up and there was nothing? There was no way you would do business with that person. Mm, right. So, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many people I have. I have a podcast, too. Sales Energizer podcast. I invite people to come on, clients to come on. I can't tell you how many clients are too chicken to come on. You probably know. Do you ever have people that don't show up or that you ask them to come and they don't? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I get no's and I'm like, you'd be a great fit. And they're like, no, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, oh my gosh. I'm going to be able to realize it's not the, 
what you put on your website that builds any kind of SEO. It's getting the backlinks. Man, if people just realize you go on 10 podcasts and then they market you from there and you're getting about all of a sudden Google says, oh, I got somebody substantial. You're literally 10 podcasts away of moving up to the first page on Google and people are too chicken to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sometimes <laughs> I you're, I- you're you're writing that one down as a note, as a key takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a few already. So we're going to have a good roll up here at the end. But, you know, I see people, sometimes it's a simple things and they can still be a little outside their comfort zone and they won't do it just because it's just a touch outside the comfort zone. And it's like, if you just do that one simple thing here, that can make a world of difference in your business and they won't. Oh my gosh. It. The comfort zone is the night, is the death. It's the death of growth is in the comfort zone. Yeah. You can't grow but through pain. I mean, that's the whole thing. A, a scab doesn't heal without pain. You got you need it. You can't grow muscles without some pain. Mm-hmm. You can't do anything. And you have to these four beliefs. So this is the and the problem is they don't believe enough. And the, there's really four beliefs that somebody needs to succeed in business and in life and in sales and the whole shebang. Uh, but mainly for your career, the first belief is the belief in your company. You got to know that your company is there behind you, that they're substantial, that you're that you could count on them to improve your brand and not ruin it, your personal brand. Uh, The second belief is in your product or service or whatever it is. So first your company, then your product of service. But everybody has the same product and everything's a commodity Mm -hmm. in in about 15 minutes. But you got to believe in the product. Third is the belief in yourself, uh, which is obvious reasons that you have to know that you're willing to to do that which others wouldn't be willing to do in order to serve your prospects so they achieve the results that they want to get. But fourth, and this is kind of the glue belief that keeps it all together. This is the cement. This is what makes the other three work. And that is the belief. I mean, not just the knowledge and the know-how, not just the the thing that you tell people or the th- stuff that you want to believe, like you internally believe that your prospect buying this product from your company and most importantly, from you, from you yourself, you're the defining difference. If they get it from you, it's better than that if they get it from anybody else on the planet. You know that you're there to follow through and you know that nobody else is willing to do it the way you're willing to do it. Now, once you have that belief, you're in roofing. Once you have that belief, you can't let your prospect buy it for somebody else. It wouldn't be fair to them. Do you know what kind of craziness goes on in the roofing industry? I know what's going on. I'm, I'm making this up right now, but you know how disreputable all these companies are and they'll just leave and go out of business and, you know, one accident yeah. and they're gone. You know, terrible. I can't in good faith for someone that I like or love, a prospect, a, a new a lifelong customer, I can't allow you to risk that. And if you have that belief, then you're willing to overcome objections. And when mm-hmm. someone says, I need to think about it, you can say, got it. That makes perfect sense. If I were you, I'd say the same thing. But let me ask you this. Do you believe that you see all these other roofs in the neighborhood? Do you believe that we could do something similar to that on your house? Yes. Do you believe that if you follow or if we do this and we have the project manager on site and we're there to help and, and we're there to answer any questions on the day of, do you believe that we can do it for you? Yes, we do. Well, then I got to ask you, what's, what's really holding you back? What are you really in your quiet time? What are you really thinking about? Now, that whole little sequence that I just did, if you don't believe in yourself enough and your product, you can't say it. Right. You just can't. You feel like a goofball saying it. But if you believe it and you have the passion for it, ultimately, sales is a transfer of energy. And there's too little of it out there right now. And if you're the purveyor of it, they crave it. They need it. And they get to say, when they talk to their friends, I got a guy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey guys, here's a quick commercial break. So have you ever wanted to invest in the stock markets on your own? Well, I have just a solution for you. Ticker is a platform that helps investors manage their own investments confidently. It's perfect for beginners and it will save more experienced investors a lot of time. Check this out, here's some of the key features. There's a customizable dashboard, 
There's also stocks, ETFs, and crypto. On the stocks page, you can search, sort, and filter by anything you want. And we have an easy to understand rating system so stocks are either on sale, watch, or overpriced. We also have a portfolio tracker and custom alerts you can set on stocks, ETFs, and crypto. So if you ever wanted to know what stocks to look for, what stocks to avoid, know when to buy, know when to sell, and help you avoid losing money in the stock markets, I invite you to join Ticker for free. All right, let's get back to the show. I like the breakdown there. Again, we'll do a roll up here, but the transfer of energy, I like what you're walking through in that situation because I've, I've studied a lot of sales just for myself to get better at sales. Now in our model for context, we're not actually selling somebody over a Zoom or on a call. It's, eh, think of it like low touch, like Netflix. We've got to sell in our language. But I know in a lot of positions, especially B2B SaaS, you're selling to a person. You could be in a call, you could be over Zoom, you could be in person, and you're going to get those objections. You get a bigger ticket price, and you got to you gotta have that high energy. You don't want to force it down their throat, but then handling the objections and getting them to move with urgency so they're not waiting another year or two if they want to act now. How do you, when you are training your customers on how to get better at sales, how do you, what kind of tactics are you teaching them and how to elevate that urgency? Yeah, well, the first thing is the understanding that everybody hates to be sold, yeah, but they love to buy. And I know yes. there are some certain industries, car salesmen, I can bring up roofing sales. I just got a new client. That's why I'm thinking of this, but I'm a car salesman. And, and there are some company, uh, some types of industries that are kind of known for aggressive salespeople. And they're kind of looked down upon in the sales community. You know, a SaaS sales, I'm an IT sales guy. I don't putz around. I'm not going to use the tactics of a, of a car sale. I'm not a used car salesman. Let me tell you something. Every IT exec, I promise you, 100% of the IT execs that you know or will ever know bought a car. Mm -hmm. They bought a car from somebody and somehow they emotionally got it. They may have known it or they maybe didn't know it, but they got emotionally attached not to the car. You can get the car anywhere. They got emotionally attached to the salesperson. The most important part of the sale is the sales person. You want to be a great salesperson? First, be a great person. And a great person will dedicate themselves to being able to really find out what the prospect or your future customer wants and creates a discovery call that creates emotion. So how do you create urgency? You ask for it at the beginning. So during your discovery call, and a discovery is, and we can go through various questions, mm -hmm. but your discovery call, which is every sales presentation, you're to find out kind of four things. Where are you right now? Where do you want to go? What's your situation right now? What's your vision? Where do you want to go? What's blocking you from getting that right now? And then what are the consequences or the ramifications if it doesn't come to fruition, if you don't get that? And once you get those questions, and you know, I, I would ask you, Sean, uh, you know, uh, you know, what if uh, you know, I don't know what your goals, but let's say, assume your goals are, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred million dollar company. I'm just saying that to you. And then mm -hmm. I, and you say, oh yeah, I want to earn a hundred million dollars. Well, you don't just stop there. You say, oh my gosh, interesting. Why, why is that important to you? And then have you tell me why it's important to you? And I said, have you ever done it before? Have you ever seen anybody, anybody do it before? What do you admire about those people? And all of a sudden, I got you in there painting a picture in your head and building up this emotion. And then I hit you with, well, well, what happens if you don't make it? You know, what happens if it doesn't go there and you don't get that goal? I, are you okay with that? And all of a sudden, I've created urgency. And then the next mm -hmm. question is simply move them and transition to the thing. I got it. So I understand where you are, Sean. You're over here on this little island. And you want to get over here to this island, right? Yes, great. And the only thing you're missing is this thing right in the middle, whatever my service yeah. is right in the middle. And so if I were to ask you, Sean, if I can get you from here to here, because you see we've done it before, and walk with you hand in hand the whole way and give you a step-by-step -step plan on how to get there, let me ask you, Sean, how soon would you want to get started? Mm, there's the question. You know, but you can't just give them the question. You got to set it up by building that emotion first, because at that point, 
they're buyers. Now you're going to have to overcome this again when you drop the price and then they're going to have an objection. Fine. But now you have some leverage. Now you have something to go back to, to call back upon, you know, and as a person and listen, and, and there's, if you want to get somebody to like you, you know, ask about them. The more somebody else talks about themselves and what yes. would they want, the more they're going to like you. And let me go off on a tangent now, if that's possible. <laughs> while you go there. So listen, Please. Um, there's four reasons why, uh, if you want to know, people hate to be sold, but they love to buy. There's four reasons why people buy. Only four. Imagine that. All you have to learn is these four reasons and you got it and you just get to play with it. I mean, it makes sense to learn them, right? All right. So the first reason they're going to buy is because they like you. Second reason they're going to buy is because they trust you. By the way, which one do you think is more important, like or trust? I'm asking trust. you, Sean. Trust. trust, trust, right. Most people say trust. It, I do these in front of uh, audiences. It could be an audience in front of 10. It could be an audience in front of 100. I always ask that question. Most people say trust. And then I ask this question. I said, now only the women. I go, how many of you women have ever gone out on a second date? Not a first date. A second date with a person that you trusted. They weren't going to kill you, but you didn't like them. Mm no hands go up. It very quickly goes to trust, Sean Tepper, but it starts with like. If they don't like you, your foot's not in the door. Fortunately, I'll show you ways to get people to like you. So they like you, they trust you. Third is they need to believe you. Belief is where your credibility comes in. Belief is your resume. Belief is your case studies. Belief is yeah. all the things that you lead with, but it's number three. And so you're screwed at the beginning. I tell that's the first thing I teach people. Don't lead with your stuff that you've done in the past. Nobody cares. Like, trust, believe. And once you have those three, you've almost made the sale. All you need is the magic at the bottom, which again brings it together. And that is desire. And once your prospect has a desire, I'll tell you what that looks like. Have you ever uh, stopped your car? and turned around and bought lemonade from two girls on the side of the road? In my neighborhood, 100%, yes. <laughs> yeah, everybody's done. Here's the question. Were you were you thirsty? I mean, you, you weren't dying no. for that. No, of course not. You were just there because it made you feel good as the buyer to get this product from them. What if your customers felt that way about you? Mm. You know, so that's it. And that's the goal. So when I'm saying if they like you and they trust you, you know what it looks like? It looks like this. You, you, you're you applying for a job and you're in an interview and they're like, you know what? We just filled that position. But hold on. Stick around a little bit. Maybe we could find something for you. That's what it looks like. Right. Sometimes in a, in a sale and in a, a SaaS sale, you missed it by a, by a day. You missed it by... You know, somebody got fired. You missed it by a month. You missed it by something right there. Oh, now I got to wait a whole nother time. But if you got all these things in front of you, hold on a second. Maybe we could find something for you. People do business with people. The You bring up a good situation there. That point four under the four reasons people buy from you, that fourth point desire to drill into that, you know, they... They could buy the same thing or something similar going elsewhere, a few other places, mm -hmm. but they choose at that point, you're saying, because of the impact it has on me as a seller or the results. I want to unpack this a little bit further. Yeah, well, I was a little unclear on that. Buyers want to buy from uh, people they like, they trust, and they mm -hmm. believe can do the work. So if you're a little higher price, uh, you know, or something like that. Hey, I, I want to work with you. Hook me up. You know, it makes them, they trust you. They know well, you'll make them look good. Like when course. I'm working with yeah. people, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm uh, working on a prospect to try to gain attention with somebody like that, I have a, a client, he, uh, they build golf courses. They're the construction crew for golf courses, like sure. all over the world, like big, beautiful golf courses. Well, golf courses, the, who you're, who you're marketing to are architects. Big architects. Now there's like Greg Neumann, architect. There's, you know, Jack Nicholson. There's Nicholas Nicholson. Which one is it? This is Nicholas. Okay. Yeah. Jack Jared Nicholson, Nicholson is an actor. That's right. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, I guess if you were selling to Lakers, you would go to him. So 
you know, when you're going to these people, man, I'm in touch with them, you know, 20 times already. I'm giving them value with, with my sales letter that I, I, that I do. I'm giving value, 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 value first. Um, it, it doesn't take long where, where the law of reciprocity kicks in. And as soon as you have the need, oh, let me, you know, let me feel good by giving this to that guy. He's been working so hard to get me. I see. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a quick story um, on how you could change people's view of you. When I was, uh, I guess, 26, 27, I had a friend here in Atlanta. I'm living in New Jersey. He invites me over just to hang out for a weekend or do something. Uh, and so I came back and we we're just hanging out and uh, takes me to a party, uh, meet some girl, uh, blonde hair, you know, Southern accent, bakes pies. I'm like, this place is when, great. when, when I know I, I went home, moved here two weeks later, asked the girl to go out with me. And uh, she says, no, I have a boyfriend. I'm like, I, I moved here. What do you, what do you mean boyfriend? Anyway, so she thought it was funny. Anyway, so she left. So the next week, I called her back again. I said, uh, hey, you want to go out? And I had this big plan, and I, I showed her what I was going to do. Uh, Are you an idiot? I have a boyfriend. And I said, yeah, but she kind of was giggling. But so next week, called her again. Next week, called her 26 times. Finally, the 27th time, I guess she broke up with the guy. She agreed to go out with me. I had great seats uh, at Old Fulton County Stadium for a Met game, Brave game whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was there and I had a great time and got a ball from Doc Gooden. It was really it's just like, a, and I went up and called my dad. I go, dad, I forgot she was down there. Anyway, so we had a great time, all that stuff. And um, I, I finally, I asked her, I said, uh, you know, why did you agree to go out with me? Oh, I should say we've been married for 28 years, two kids, and, and, you know, and the story, yet to, yeah, yet, yet to have a bad day. But I did say to her, I said, you know, you know, why did you finally give in? What did you what did you agree to? And she said this and this has to do with sales. She says, I figured if you were willing to work this hard to get me, you'd be willing mm -hmm. to work equally as hard to keep me. And in my little sales brain, you know what I heard? It's flattering when you really want something. And you're willing to go after it and creatively think of ways that will help them. It's flattering. And so your customers are just as susceptible to these emotional triggers as any other. Listen, 98% of the people you're going to meet in this world are human. There are 2%. They're called lawyers. Nothing works on them. But aside from that, everything works. By the way, I should say about my wife, she hasn't baked a pie since. <laughs> the bait and switch tactic okay that's it you know how they get you they'll screw you at the drive-thru that's it <laughs> sold you on that and here you are no yeah. pies <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious um what i'd like to do next is kind of a roll up for our audience here you, you just gave away a whole bunch of great tactics here and then i'm going to ask you what is one more key takeaway you can give our audience and then we're going to get into the rapid fire round and have a little more fun okay. so i'm going to do roll up here as best as i can to kind of summarize the hot tips audience so i'm breaking the fourth wall here they know the drill i'm talking to you i'm going to kind of go through got a few sub bullets as well so i've got nine core sales tactics here with a few subs within. So first one is mindset, understanding and believing. I'm big on that. I I won't talk in detail of this, but I, I get a little annoyed by the, the fake guru, quote unquote, that all they do is sell motivational courses and, and make people's feelings feel better. I think that's a bunch of garbage, but some of it, it does check out. And that understanding and believing in yourself is super important. So I can, I can get on board with that. All right. Number two, um, don't worry about looking like an idiot. You're willing to go the extra mile, even if you do look dumb. And I think that's great. As, as business owners, you need to be trying different things because you have to figure out the formula and what works. And yeah, some cases you might look dumb. That's okay. All right. Number three, beliefs. You got four here, four sub bullets within this point three. You've got belief in your company, belief in your product, belief in yourself, and belief the prospect will get the best results when they buy from you. I thought that was great. All right. Number four, 
sales is a transfer of energy. If you're in, I totally believe this. If you're coming to the call, the Zoom call, phone call in person with the wrong energy, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Transfer that energy, you better come with the right energy. Number five, people hate to be sold, but they love to buy. Heard that before. I thought that was a good yeah, one. Yeah, that's to- a Jeffrey. We got to give credit to Jeffrey Gittimer for that. Okay. Yeah, I have heard that before. That's a good one. Okay. Um, number six, if you want to be a great salesperson, you have to be a great person. And there's a comment well, you probably- first, first to be a great person. Work on number one and yeah, then yeah. You have it to give to others. Yeah, it's yeah. not- and, and it's it's not like wait to start selling until you become great. No, you're working on it. On this point six, something very similar. You probably heard this line too, which is people don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you how care. Much you care. Yeah, that's yeah. it. You know, becoming a, a great person, by the way, obviously is subjective. But you know, coaches, coaches like football coaches or any kind of coaches who have losing seasons for many years, still get jobs with other teams, Mm. you know? And so it's because people, you know, celebrate your effort and then everybody will celebrate your results. That's a good call. Yeah. Love it. All right. Number seven, we got a few points here that are all about, um, we like to get tactical. People like to walk away with, what can I actually do today? So a lot of this is is psychological and mindset, but this seven is really tactical. So it's this discovery. Walk them through these points. Number one within seven is where are you now? Number two, where do you want to go? Number three, what's blocking you? And number four, what are the consequences if you don't get to where you want to go? And then follow up with a simple question. Are you okay with that? Oh, that kills them. That's the best thing. (laughs) All right. This leads to number eight, which kind of echoes what you just said. I call it reframing is like you walk through the questions, then then you reframe it to the customer. It's like, okay, so based on what you said, you told me you're here. This is where you are. Here's where you want to go. What's blocking you? What are the consequences if you don't get it? And then I, I wrote it a little differently. I like that. Are you okay with that? I wrote, if I can walk you through all the processes and help you achieve those results. How soon would you like to get started? That's it. Yeah. yeah. And that, and that, and, and you want an answer, you know, you want an answer right away. And yeah. now that's transferring the discovery call into the sales pitch. Yeah. Like right now you have, you don't, you have any solution anymore, but once you have that, now there's a couple more things and you're able to transfer and ask for the order. You're building leverage. Yep. yep. Right there on the call. So that was number eight. Number nine, this is a home run. Four reasons why people buy. They like you. This is not, we got four points within number nine. So number one, they like you. Number two, they trust you. Number three, they believe you. And number four, desire. Yeah, that's money. That's money. My, uh, my son, one day he decided he was going to start a junk removal business. By the way, he's 25 now. He bought a house at 19 and he uh, has commercial property and all this stuff from this junk removal business that he started when he was 11 years old. And uh, he went to this first house and at first day he made $250. And I said, you know, what did you do? You know, because he would just go collect a chair or, a, uh, you know, a lawnmower on the side of the house or a couch or something. And I'd take it to the dump. And I said, Matthew, this is crazy. How do you do this? And he says, Daddy, you you just don't get it. He says, uh, you think these people are giving me a chair and a couch and a lawnmower because they need to get rid of their chair and their couch and a lawnmower. And I'm a stupid dad. I said, yeah. And he said, no, dad. He says, they're doing this because it makes them feel good to do business with an 11 year old. Mm. That little bastard. Yes. You see, he knew his value. He knew what he was selling innately, and we keep on having have to find it. He said one other thing, which was really great. He goes, Daddy, I got like two years left of cuteness, and it's over. <laughs> this guy's got a personality at a young age. Man. He's a good kid. That's awesome. All right. Before we jump into the rapid fire round, what is one more key takeaway you can give our audience? Oh, gosh. All right. Well, this is another segmented thing. Okay, here it is. There are... I know what you're doing already, and it's wrong. And this is it. There are three words that literally 
repel your prospects from you. It's like you're pushing them away on purpose. And that is when somebody asks you what you do, you're using the three words that repel. And those three words are I, we, and us. And if you could do one thing that will dramatically improve your marketing and your sales and your sales calls and your conversations, it's to use the three words that attract. And those three words are you, yours, and I'm in the South, so we say y'all. But if I was back in New Jersey, I'd say use guys. But so what it sounds like is this. Hey, if you're like most of the rest of our clients, You have three main worries. Uh, You have the worry that you're not going to get enough consistent customers coming in. And you're worried that you're going to pay too much for those that you are getting in. And then you're not going to be able to close the ones that are coming in. Am I pretty close to the truth? And if that was you, I got you nodding your head four times without telling you at all what I do. But if that's you, you're interested and you say, Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Can you help me with that? Now you're in a discovery call. Yeah, yeah. You, yours, y'all, or use guys. There you go. (laughs) Nailed it. This is good stuff, Dan. I really love our episode so far, but we're not done yet. Let's get into the rapid fire round. And this is the part of the episode where we get to find out who Dan really is. If you can try to answer each question in about 15 seconds or less. You ready? Okay, I'm ready. All right. What is your favorite podcast? Uh, I watch Joe Rogan. Who doesn't like Joe Rogan? Captivating show, for sure. I can't always sit through a three-hour episode, but uh, I can chip away at a, an episode here and there. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a listener while I'm outside doing some activities. There you go. There you go. All right. What is a recent book you read and would recommend? Oh, gosh, The Ultimate Sales Machine, Chet Holmes, and I'm reading the 12-week year currently right now. Both absolutely awesome. By the way, you can get my book, too, Sales Proverbs, Wisdom of the Ages, available on Amazon. A little shameless plug there. We'll we'll have you promote that at the end. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Good ones you listed there. We got a fun one here. Movie question. What is your favorite movie? Uh, movie, You know, I'm not a movie guy. Uh, I can't remember the last movie I've actually gone to, but I've recently watched Dune, which was awesome. Uh, gosh, what is my favorite movie that I could watch? I guess The Princess Bride. I could probably, uh, I could probably do the whole thing. Ah, oh, you're using Vanity's defense defense against me, huh? I would think it only could fit in considering the rocky terrain. Obviously, you expect me to attack with this Cavatel. I'll find the Caballero of my. I, yeah, I, I could do that whole movie. You know it. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> We're on different sides of the spectrum here. You've got kind of this classic comedy versus, you know, deeper sci-fi. I'm a big sci-fi guy. So Dune part yeah. one and two, uh, love them. Absolutely. Well, love my, them. I, I just watched the one I'm waiting. My, my, my daughter just got married like three months ago mm-hmm. and Vincent, the new son-in-law is a big fan. And so I'm, I want to watch the second one with him. Ah, Okay, so you watched part one that came out a few years ago. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we could talk all day on that. I'll keep moving. (laughs) Okay, all right. So, what is the worst advice you ever received? Oh, well, uh, I got terrible advice as a kid, and it was this: it was like, don't run across the street, and and be careful, and that kind of garbage. I, I mean, it's idiotic not to run across the street. I mean, if you run, you get there faster and it's like less. It makes no sense not to run. You're going to trip. And if you trip, you'll get up and then you're still ahead of the game. And that affects yourself in the real world because, you know, people take too long to make decisions. Let's, you know, don't make a bad decision. Are you kidding me? Make a bad decision. Go fast. You know, if you pick the wrong building, you'll be up to the top. You'll realize you're the wrong place. You come back down, go to the other building before the other guy even got started. So the worst advice was, uh, you know, look before you leap. Be careful. Don't run across the street. Mm. Don't take any risks in your life. How about that? Right? Yeah. I. I you know, but, but the problem with risks are they're subjective. Uh, and so like what's risky for some is not risky for others and, and right. things like that. But if someone is a risk taker, encourage it, mm-hmm. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, that's all. Don't. And if someone's not, then, you know, encourage that. 
but don't take somebody away from their natural thing. And so the best advice I would have got is to just do the opposite of that, which you feel was done wrong when you were a kid. And so that's what I did with my kid. You know what I said to my kids when they went off to school, take some chances today. I love that encouragement. Good call. Yeah. If you got it, it goes back to something you said earlier is people get stuck in a comfort zone. And if it's very low risk, it's like you don't have those big moments where you can create those wins and learn something new and, and step outside the box and like, oh, okay. So if I do it this way, that that can move me forward, you know, 10 steps as opposed to two steps in the same amount of time. Yeah. And and you realize it's not that bad. I remember the first time I got punched in the face and I was thinking. Not that bad. I mean, I mean, I, I'll, I'll live through this, you know, whatever. And then you're not scared the next time. But, you know, some people have gone through life and never been punched in the face. Mm-hmm. And that's probably a bad example. Metaphorically. But, but, yeah. Yes. Met- metaphorically, it's doable. But you never got kicked out of an office. I mean, you got to get kicked out of an office one where someone asks you to leave. Don't you see that no soliciting sign out there? I mean, if you didn't get that once in your life, I yeah. mean, you haven't lived. Right. right. <laughs> All right, let's flip the equation here. What's the best advice you ever received? So much from your dad. Yeah, well, that one, uh, that one was really good. My dad gave me so many good ones. I'm trying to think of a, I'll start it. Danny. Ah, yes. Okay. So this was his thing. Uh, He would say, uh, Danny, in this country, you have to follow the 11th commandment. And I said, what's that? He says, never pay retail. And what he was saying by that is don't pay money to go to school, get yourself a job that does that thing and have them teach it to you Yeah, and pay you to learn. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You know, get a customer before you start your marketing program that you want to sell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I've heard amazing stories of people building businesses and they literally don't do anything except or when they get a paying customer first, like there's no website, there's no business card. There's Nothing. No Nothing. You You'll solve, have them pay for it. Yeah. Have, have Solve a problem for somebody. Do the work. Make yes. money first and then create those things. So many entrepreneurs get that backwards and have to invest all this time and money and all this stuff. And then we'll get paid. And then customers. they're scared to launch. Yes. Because what if it doesn't work and they have all this stuff invested? Invest yeah. in yourself looking like a fool and getting shot down at the beginning before you do, before you go and create a whole program and you don't know that if people want, you know, people get pretty much what they deserve. And if the market, it's not you or me to say what a good product or service is, the market always decides. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Good call. All right. Last question. Here's a time machine question. If you could go back in time to give your younger self advice, what age would you visit and what would you say? Oh, I would be, I would be 11 years old. I'd be on my bicycle all by myself in the summertime because all my friends went to camp. And I would say, make sure that you go on that eight month long hitchhiking experience because it will make you to the person that you want to become. And don't let anybody talk you out of it which they almost did. Yeah. So I, I did the best thing in the world it was for eight months. I took no money and I took a hitchhiking trip around the country and eight months. Wow. Yeah. I lived on the side of the road. It was the greatest thing. If I didn't have another appointment in two minutes, I would tell you about it, yeah. but we'll keep it moving here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I love, I love that story. That's awesome. All right. Last question here. This is obviously you got to tell us where can people find you, reach you and where's the book? Yeah. Okay. So there's a, a, there's a new website out there. It's called Google and just put my name in there. Dan Jordan, that's J O U R D A N. And I'm the most accessible guy on the planet. It's impossible. You'll get my number, my home number, my cell number, my wife's number, my email, everything is there. If you are having, if you're one of those people that needs more customers, and needs more profitable sales, and is having a challenge in anything that has to do with that process, you got a guy. All right. Well, Dan, thank you so much for your time. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. All right. We'll be in touch. See ya. All right. Rock on. 